We're going to be looking at the 78th Psalm today. So Psalm 78, verses 1 through 22. Now, today in our series on real families, we're talking about leaving a spiritual legacy. And on a 140th anniversary of the life of a church, uh, we figured legacy was a pretty good theme for us to, to embrace. The idea of living, leaving a legacy can sound sort of intimidating to a lot of us. We say, well, that's, that's something famous people do. Presidents, people whose names are going to be in history books on monuments. Legacy is what they do. Legacy is a lot more. Legacy is the story of your life that lives on after you. It's the footprint that you leave in this world when you are no longer in this world. And you write your story every day through the values that you embrace, through the life that you live, through your legacy. Whether positive or negative, it's your legacy, and it's always up to you. And when you view your life through this lens of your daily actions, we're all building our legacy just every day, in every choice, in every moment. What we will be remembered for, the mark we will leave, and how... Uh, will impact the lives we leave behind. So I have, uh, I have a whole set of Bibles in my office, Bibles that I read, uh, I've read over the last few years. I love going back and looking at old Bibles that I mark. And uh, depending on the year that I read the Bible, it's interesting what I have highlighted because it just does tell this is what life was like that year. This is what God was doing in my life in that year. This is how he spoke to me. This is where I was struggling. This is where I wanted to grow or God told me I needed to grow and uh, work through. Well, I also have some collection Bibles, family Bibles. This Bible, my parents got when they got married. They, they went away from their marriage ceremony with this Bible 60-something years ago. And uh, when they downsized uh, their home, they said, we want you to have this because I have a whole set of family Bibles that belong to members of our family through generations on both sides of, both sides of my family. And... Uh, some of you have seen my, my oldest of those Bibles. It's a, it's a big old Bible uh, that was uh, printed in 1850. Has lots, belonged to my great, great, great grandfather, John Self, and uh, marked up lots of family dates, family history written in the front of it, as they did with old family Bibles like that back in the day. But I'm grateful for that kind of heritage uh, through Christ's fear, joy. Loss, God's Word. And uh, that's a legacy I'm grateful for. And when I, when I think of God's Word, it, in my office especially, when I'm doing my morning Bible reading, as I did this morning, and I see all these Bibles surrounding me that mean so much to me and my family, just thankful to God for that legacy, to be reminded God is still on His throne, mighty to deliver, mighty to save. That God still answers prayer. He heals broken hearts. He restores broken families. He brings meaning to life. He just makes things right. And he makes things to make sense. My personal Christian testimony and example is important to me. But nowhere is my testimony and example more important to me than in the impact on my, my two children. And that was true when they were little, and it's true now that they're young adults. You know, as a church leader, and I've been at this for a while, I can tell you what I have observed. And it is when mamas and daddies settle for tipping their hat toward, toward the Lord, just you know, touch base here and there with the Lord, with His church, with His people. When, when that, is, that is the pattern those children often grow up with little to no interest in the things of God. And, and that makes this whole legacy thing vitally important. That We talked about this in a different context when we started this series. But you know, for a parent, if you're a five in your relationship to Christ, out of a, in a one to ten scale, your kids are going to come out maybe a two. Uh, a lot less than that. It's not going to be nearly so important to them, if important at all. So this makes this vitally important because your children know where your commitments lie. They know early on how you spend your time and how you spend your money and how you use your gifts. It's going to demonstrate your priorities. And one of the questions that's important to ask all through the journey, what regards to the age of your children, is 
You know, what, what are they seeing in me? Yeah, I know life is complicated, and I know work is demanding, and I know distractions are many. But one of the things that I've determined early on is that I wanted my kids to know that I love Jesus. And I wanted them to know that I love their mother. And I wanted them to know that I love them. And I don't want to leave them guessing about any of that stuff. And what I have observed in 35 or so years of full-time ministry and what researchers are telling us everywhere just now as they're looking at a lot of generational studies is that the next generation at best is guessing what's important to the current generation of adults and uh, those, those who are, have children and grandchildren. Here's another angle on this story. My family legacy is very important to me. And I care about what's going to happen to my two kids. And I'm also going to tell you this, that as a follower of Jesus Christ, I, don't, I can't stop there. That's not one of the options God's given me. I have, to care, I have to care about your children too, whatever age your children are. And I am called by God as a follower of Jesus Christ, not because I'm a pastor, because I love Jesus. I got to care about the next generation that's outside the walls of this place in this community. And I need to care about children around the world who need to know Jesus and who need to know his love. And that they would be faithful also to not only know the Savior, but to pass the Savior on to the next generation. Today we're going to focus our thoughts on the end of the story of your life. And we're all on a journey. But what would you want your family portrait to look like? The legacy you would leave behind. This is the mark that I have left. And One of our struggles is we live so much in the present. Just what's going to make me happy today? In this moment, we make these impulsive decisions and we make decisions in seasons of life that we think, oh, I can make up for it later, but somehow we never get around to making it up later. And a lot of things start falling through the cracks and there are consequences for families. What is the legacy you're going to leave for your family? What, are you, what legacy are you going to leave for the random people that your life is going to intersect their lives? They're always watching you in... The book of Hebrews, there's the uh, great faith chapter, chapter 11. And a whole set of faith-filled people run through that chapter but really, really early because we're talking about Abel, the son of Adam and Eve. Here's what it says. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, he still speaks even though he's dead. What an interesting thing. This guy, centuries, centuries, centuries earlier, but yet the Bible says, by faith, he still speaks. His testimony still rings out. What he accomplished and how he did it, people still notice. People still celebrate his righteousness, his faithfulness to God, all those things. What are you passing on today? What legacy are you leaving? I was a college student when I came across a printed sermon. He'd already... Uh, passed away at that time. Uh, Clyde Fant wrote a sermon. The, the title of the sermon was Planting Shade Trees You'll Never Sit Under. And now, you know, it resonates with me really well because Rhonda and I, we lived in a variety of apartments uh, early on in marriage. And then we've lived in four different houses since we've been married. And in each of those four houses, we have planted trees. And in those first, now we've been in this last, last house a pretty good while, the house before that a good while, but the first two, we weren't there very long, and we planted trees. In that uh, first house, there is a beautiful, huge shade tree in the front yard today. We drove by a few years ago, went back and visited. But you know what? I just had to worry about not running over it with my lawnmower when we lived there, because it was just a little bitty thing. Now, a huge planted a shade tree I never sat under. Second house, we planted a shade tree, and it's a huge thing now, and a couple of fruit trees. Somebody is enjoying the fruit of those trees. They have never sent a thank you note to me, but they're enjoying the produce of trees I never got to enjoy, but I planted because uh, I really figured somebody's going to come along after me, and they'll really appreciate a shade tree that the previous owner never got to sit under. That's a lot of what legacy is. 
It's uh, the benefit from an investment that someone else gets to enjoy. You leave something of value for others. And uh, that's some of how you'll be remembered. Well, what, do you, what do you want people to say? What monuments would you like people to build to your, to your honor? What, what would those monuments reflect? And, and I think about my own children. And from the beginning when God first entrusted them to us, uh, I've always said, I've, I've, I've never encouraged, pushed, or even prayed, dear God, let them be in, in ministry. Uh, it, as I have been called to ministry, because the only reason you enter ministry is because you felt the call of God specifically to your life to do, to do this work. But, but I have from early on, and if God called them later on, I'd certainly bless that. But my greatest desire from the beginning is that they would come at er, early in life to know Jesus as their Savior. And both of them did. And that they'd be equipped with a sense of the gospel staying power. And they'd remain true to the Lord all their days and they'd faithfully serve Him through a fellowship of believers, a local church, wherever they are, whatever they're doing. And, and that is a lasting legacy of faith. But I'll tell you this, my desire for my children and those things, I have the same desire for your children. Whatever age your children are, from adults to, to preschoolers, I want the same thing for you. I want your children to come to know Christ early, to walk with Christ for a lifetime, to serve Him, to know Him, to experience the staying power of the gospel. And, and they're your children, your grandchildren, and I hope you join me in that desire. We want to impress this upon the next generation. You know, Jesus became angry at His disciples, uh, angry about something, just occasion uh, here and there, not often. But one of the times He became angry is when His disciples said, that next generation, those kids, that's not important. Adults are what's important. And they push the kids, children away. Jesus said, oh, do not hinder the children. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. He still cares about the next generation. And we have to care about the next generation. I remember, uh, I've been reading through the history books in the Old Testament in the last couple of months. So in Kings, the book of Kings, and this is Second Kings, King Hezekiah. And he's... We, we talked, uh, well, when we began the series, we talked about the kings of Israel and how some did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. A lot of them did what was wrong in the eyes of the Lord. One of the good kings in the southern kingdom of Judah centered around Jerusalem was Hezekiah. He was one of the good guys. And King Hezekiah, he honored the Lord. He got rid of idolatry. He did a lot of good stuff. He was a man of great prayer. Here's the thing about Hezekiah. Toward the end of his life, he just really made a dumb decision. And here's how... Isaiah the prophet confronted him. He said, you made a bad call, and this is going to cost your children and your grandchildren deeply. He's pointing toward the exile, the Babylonians coming in and just wiping them out. And your children and your grandchildren are going to suffer. Here's what Hezekiah said. He said, well, at least everything will be okay in my life. What a jerk, you know? At least everything will be okay in my life. How short-sighted can, can we be? And yet we are often, intentionally or unintentionally, we may not say it out loud, short-sighted. Our legacy is being determined right now. I want to read from Psalm 78. And I'll read the first 11 verses, and then we'll pick up a couple of summary verses uh, toward the end. Here's what the 78th Psalm, a Psalm of Asaph. Uh, he's, the, he's the songwriter for David. He says, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old things. We have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We'll not hide them from their children, but will tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob, appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach their children, that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children. You see, generation, generation, generation. So that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. 
The Ephraimites, armed with the bow, turned back on the day of battle. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. They forgot his works and the wonders he had shown them. They forgot the miracles, the the glory of God on display. So verse 17 says, even after they saw all these amazing things, yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High God in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. Not only were they disobeying God, they were complaining about how God did, did, did God's business. Verse 22, there comes wrath and judgment from the Lord, anger of the Lord, because they did not believe in God and did not trust His saving power. This uh, chapter is such a great chapter on legacy and generational sharing of the faith, one generation to the next generation to the next generation, teaching those who'd come after us. I want to, I want to break that out. What does that teaching look like? How does it shape up for us? What does it look like in our application? So you have an outline, your program. You want to make note of a couple of these things. The responsibility of teaching is the first thing, verses 4 and 5. Jesus instructed his disciples in the ways of God, and he used life as a classroom. And Jesus didn't leave things to chance, like, well, you know, whatever you pick up's okay. Hey, I hope you figured this out on your own. He carefully instructed them in God's truth. You must be born again. You are the light of the world. Love your enemies. Love one another. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this other stuff you worry about. It's going to come together. Be a fisher of men. Follow me. Jesus took advantage of every teachable moment to teach his disciples. And when we think about when do you do this, regardless of how old, how young your children are, your grandchildren are, you take advantage of every teachable moment. As the psalmist said, verse 4, we will not hide them from our children. Man, if you don't tell your children, you might as well be hiding it from them. If you don't push the agenda of the gospel forward in your children's life, your grandchildren's life, you might as well just be hiding it from them. Oh, tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and His might and the wonders He has done. Children need and want guidance. and Just don't ever apologize for doing that. They need regular doses of Jesus all the time and everywhere. And uh, I've had this conversation so many times. I've run into the statement so often. Yesterday, again, I uh, heard the story of a parent who said, Well... My parents kind of pushed that religion on me, and so I'm, not, I'm going to let my children decide and do whatever they want to do. And so would you do that with their, well, you know, I'm not going to tell my kids you ought to eat food that's good for you. They can just go to the snack bar and do, do, get, get whatever junk they want to eat, and I'm all good with that. And I'm not going to worry about their education. They really don't care for it that much, so I'm not going to. No. You guide your children. You help your children. You encourage your children in the right direction. You don't just let them run wild on anything. And why would you do that with their eternal soul? And yet people do it all the time. And the parent that says, I don't let them grow up any way they want to. I don't want to push anything on them. You're the only voice in their life that is not trying to push something on them. The rest of the world, the culture around, is trying desperately to pull them away from the Lord. Don't give up your voice. Do not ever give up your voice. You tell them all the time. Teach them all the time. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart. This is the Lord's word in Deuteronomy. In your heart, in your soul. Bind them as a sign on your hand. That they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children. Talking of them when you're sitting in your house. When you're walking along the way. When you lie down. When you rise. Everywhere, all the time, is a teachable moment to point your children, your grandchildren, the next generation to Jesus. And don't, don't give up that voice. This begins with the step of knowing God in a personal way, relationship to Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. That's true for all of us. You can't teach something you haven't experienced. And when you've given your life to Christ, then you're uniquely positioned to carry forward this good news of Jesus. It continues with you living this life of dedication to Jesus Christ. And your children also know whether you really believe it or not. Or you just check the box. Yeah, the Jesus box. They know if it's real for you. Uh, I ask you this question. I want to encourage you in it. Have you ever told your children, told your grandchildren, here's how I came to know Jesus as my Savior. 
here's when, here's where, here's how, here's how it all came together. Here's what I, I heard from the Lord. Here's the conviction I felt. And this is how I became a believer. I, I'm amazed at how many people I talk to, uh, and as we're out in the community talking to folks about spiritual things, who say, oh yeah, I've been a Christian my whole life. Well, you know, nobody's a Christian their whole life, just, so, just for the record. You're born a little sinner on their way to hell. And, and until you come to know Jesus, that's not changing. So, nobody's been a Christian your whole life. Oh, yeah, I grew up in church. My parents had us in church every time the doors were open. And uh, man, oh, man, I was baptized when I was 12 years old. And not, not, so far, you haven't told me anything about a relationship to God through Jesus Christ. You just tell me a bunch of religious stuff. Has there been a time in your life when you made a commitment of your life to Christ? Any of you ever told that story to your children, to your grandchildren? Because the story is powerful, especially when it's that story. So here's parents, you know, they'll tell their kids, hey, let me tell you about the big game. Let me tell you about the big deal I closed the work. Let me tell you what I did in high school and college. But never tell them about your eternal soul being saved by Jesus Christ. Get that story in there. Tell your children about an answered prayer, how God came through and you just never imagined. Tell them about when God gave you guidance in an important decision. Tell them about, G, about God, how he helped you to overcome a temptation, uh, pulled you out of the depths of sin. A, a story about a relate, relationship to God will mean more than just, just telling a bunch of biblical principles and you ought to kind of things. Tell them about a commitment you made, a sacrifice you made, and how God worked through it. Teach, teach, teach. Here's the reason for the teaching. There are a lot of reasons for teaching, reminding our children, our grandchildren, the next generation in our family, in our community, to the ends of the earth, the truths of God's word, the reality of faith in Christ. But the psalmist focuses on one major reason in Psalm 78. Because the goal is you give this generation a good enough dose of Jesus that they believe it strongly enough that they'll tell the next generation. There's a baton pass that has to take place in the faith. And if that baton gets dropped because this generation really didn't get it, then that next generation may be really far from God. It's one of the sobering truths of history. We are always one generation away from extinction in the faith. And uh, that's that's a scary something for me. The baton gets dropped, the chain gets broken, and all of a sudden there's a generation that arises that they're far from God. Joshua, near the end of his life, we shared this. Some of you have uh, this, one of these last phrases on your, a plaque on your wall at home. Joshua, near the end of his life, he led the Israelites in the conquest of the promised land, challenged them toward the end of his days. His legacy, decide about God. Just decide. So now, fear God. Worship him in total commitment. Get rid of the gods your ancestors worship on the far side of the river, the Euphrates, and in Egypt. You worship God. If you'd rather... Uh, if you decide that it's a bad idea to worship God, then choose a God you'd rather serve and do it today. I mean, choose, just go ahead and fly your colors, whatever they are. Choose one of the gods your ancestors worshipped in the country beyond the Jordan or one of the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me and my family, me and my house, we will serve, we will worship the Lord. And he declares, this is, this is where we stand. And here's, here's what the people said in response to that. Oh, we'd never forsake God. Never. We'd never leave God to worship other gods. And for the most part, they didn't. They were fairly steady and true to throughout Joshua's life. And those who knew Joshua and saw the things in Joshua's ministry. and th- Those years of the conquest, they, they stayed fairly true. And then you get to the next book in the Bible... Come to find out that generation that they said, oh, we, we will never leave God. They didn't, but unfortunately, they didn't pass the baton to the next generation. They forgot about the, they forgot to really make, impress this upon their children and their grandchildren. And so here's what you get. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, know the work that he had done for Israel. In one generation... It's just a scramble of darkness spiritually. And the period of the judges comes in. And what happens in the period of the judges is you have people that they're far from God. And they realize, wait a minute, we, 
we're not doing what we ought to do. And they'll go looking and they'll, oh, we need to turn back to God. God would send a judge and deliver them. They'd be set free from that spiritual bondage and physical bondage to the Philistines or the Moabites or somebody else. And then, well, they, they forgot to really impress that on their kids and their grandkids. And before long, they're far from God again. It's a real, it's a real train wreck of of spiritual world, and then they'll, they'll circle back around. It's the spiritual dark ages in the life of God's people. You know, you, uh, <clears throat> some of you have seen pictures. Uh, our, our team who have been in Europe, uh, a lot of pictures on social media, and, uh, just amazing buildings and be- the beauty of the places where they've been serving the Lord. But one of the things they took lots of pictures of were big cathedrals in Europe and beautiful, magnificent places of worship that are mostly empty because generationally the, the baton got dropped and folks just uh, forgot about God. That can happen. It can happen in a family. It can happen in a church. It can happen in a nation. And one day we'll wake up and just... Uh, the legacy is far from God. We look at the example of the teacher. And one of the things, uh, verse 8, 10 through 11, 17 to 18, 22, is that so much of impressing the good news of Jesus, the, the story of our Lord on the next generation and generations, one of the big things about that is what you say only has so much power, but what you do and how you live out what you say There's a lot of pop to that. Jesus not only taught them, he modeled godly living for his disciples. They saw him pray. They saw his compassion for people. They saw his burden for the spiritual lostness of the world around him, the sacrifice he made for it. They saw integrity in his actions. Ralph Waldo Emerson had this quote. He said, who you are speaks so loudly, I can't hear what you're saying. That your example is, is, is the big voice. What do you really believe? It's by what you do, by the choices you make day to day. And the next generation is watching us. They watch how we do business. They watch how we do church and how we do family and how we handle conflict and how we handle money and how we behave when times are good and times are bad. And the danger is found in what our children will become if we, if we fail in our sacred trust to tell them about Jesus and to live out the Christian life before them in a way that is transformational and life-changing. The danger is we just won't tell our children. The danger is they'll be trapped in sin. The danger is they won't have the impact in our culture of salt and light. We're seeing generational sin now in our own nation. The danger is that they won't spend eternity in heaven with us. There's a lot riding on doing this and doing it well. And then the blessing of teaching. If your child goes out, uh, we're going to have cold weather this week, and here, not too long from right now. Child goes out, you, you prepare them, you, you bundle them up, and make sure young children are going to be in good shape in the weather. If your child is playing sports, you make sure they have their shin guards and they have the new glove for baseball, whatever they're playing, everything they need to compete well. What are we doing with our children to equip them for the challenges? and the crises they will face for the rest of their lives. and How well equipped are they for eternity? They have the tools that they need to survive well in a dark, cold, sinful world. Jesus set about to equip his followers in such a way that they would continue on without his physical presence. While he, when he was not physically with them, he leaves the Holy Spirit sends the Holy Spirit to guide them to be that presence of God in their hearts, but He equipped them for what they needed. What does the next generation and every generation need? They need a personal relationship to God through Jesus Christ. They need to learn to rely on the power of prayer. They need a love for God's word. They need a commitment to church community and the local church. And those are anchors for the soul that are going to hold a child tight as they get older and become adults. And the senior adults, it will hold them tight when life is hard. What, What would you like to leave behind as a legacy? Of a life changed. What is the blessing of sharing uh, the Lord with the next generation? Verse 22 says that they'd believe in God. Verse 8 says that they'd be loyal to God. Verse 11 says they will know 
what God has done. They've heard a lot of testimony from you. That they'll pass on the baton of faith to the next generation. That's a big blessing. That they would be in heaven with you is a bottom line big statement. What I'm about to share with you is something I've shared five times previously since I've been in Allen. We, this list in just a moment. We live our lives and we run our races and we experience all kinds of things. But if we don't have the end in mind, we may end up in a place we never intended to be, never intended to go. So one of these days, I'm going to get to the end of my life. Jesus doesn't come again in my lifetime. I'm going to come to the end of my life. And, you know, I'd hope, among other things, that I don't know if anybody else will show up at my funeral, but I sure do hope that Rhonda and my two kids would, and they'd still... They'd still love Jesus, and they'd still love me, and they'd still love the church uh, when they get to that spot. And several years ago now, and I've, I've combined some things, and I add things periodically, but this is a list of what I want it to look like at the end. Because if you don't have the end in mind, you may not land at the right spot. So, you want to make your own list maybe, but here's for me. And if today is my last day. Or if... Uh, if it's decades from now, here's, here's where, uh, for me, I think legacy would land where I want it to land. I hope that on my last day, I would still be believing with all my heart that a great commitment to the great commission and the great commandment would grow a great church, and it's still growing great Christians. And that I would finish with my integrity intact, that those who know me best would respect me most, I'd still be surprised by God at how he does things and what he does. That my next step with God would ever be before me. 2018 has been a wonderful next step year for me. Of God doing new things in my life. And just always looking for my next step. I pray that on my last day my marriage vows would be all paid up. That my kids would know that faith in Christ isn't just true but it works for life. That the Bible, today, you know, I open up my, my Bible that I'm doing my reading through this year, and that God's Word, no matter how many times I have read it, the passages I've seen over and over, that God would still be saying things that just jump off the page at me, the living Word of God. That, that God would still be stirring in me uh, a holy discontent here and there that just says this cannot continue to be if I have a voice and the energy to address it in some way in my world I am going to do something in the name of the Lord to make a difference in this that my children would be loving and serving the God of their father and passing it on that I'd not be ashamed for what I do when no one else will know to be shouted in the streets. That I would still be believing the church is the hope of the world because God has entrusted the church the only message that will change in eternity. That I still have a passion in my life to see lost people found, found people formed into the image of Christ and formed people set free to serve and to grow and to share and to become. And that on my last day, I, no matter how dark the world is, feels, no matter how difficult life is in the details of it, that I would finish still with an, a ridiculously otherworldly optimism that in a broken, sinful world filled with darkness and hurt, division, strife, struggle, I would still know and be making known the truth that nobody's story has to end with broken. That Jesus is still changing lives and he can change anybody's life to his glory. We want to finish well. I've seen a lot of people who ran legs of the race well. Um... Uh, that, hey, my 30s and 40s, man, I was, I was all in for the Lord serving and doing. My 50s and 60s, uh, it timed out. 
people who say, well, I, I, you know, I did it when my kids were young because, I mean, they needed to see it then, but now they're adults, so I don't really care anymore. And they fall away. And I've been at this long enough to see dozens and dozens of people that I love dearly who, man, is that something a believer can do? Can you just walk away from Christ for decades? It's not enough just to run legs of this race well. I want to finish well because that's where legacy is created.